Hi everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to Ilham Gallery. Uh, in the spirit of Nirmala Dutt's works exploring environmental issues, we are delighted to be hosting It's Getting Hot In Here, a talk by Wong Siu Lin of Makaranga, an award-winning Malaysian environmental publication. Today, Siu Lin will delve into the facts and myths of climate change and the sustainability movement. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Siu Lin. Thanks very much for, um, for doing this, and I hope that it helps you sort of get your head space into this, this afternoon's talk. Uh, I'm going to try and um, not be too technical, but um, you know, there's going to be time for a Q&A. Don't ask me too difficult questions. Uh, I've been an environmental journalist for about 30 years, so I know a little bit about uh, envir environmental matters and climate and sustainability, and that's what we do at Makaranga. We are a niche publication. Uh, which is online only, and we focus on issues in Malaysia. We do long-form analytical writing because we feel there's a gap for that in Malaysia. Uh, and basically today we are here, so thank you very much to Rahel uh, for inviting me here. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, a real honour to be here at Ilham, uh, and this is an amazing exhibition. So if you've not had a chance to walk through it, uh, please do spend time here. Uh, so basically today it's, it's two counter... Um, I, I think there was a Yale study which said basically that people don't know as much about the climate crisis as they think they do. Uh, and they did uh, an inter international study. Unfortunately, it was only by Facebook, so we've missed out the entire TikTok generation. But what they did find is that uh, there's a lot of miscon misconceptions. I'm not here to set everything right, but it's, I'm going to sort of, uh, sort of try and appeal to the, the most... A basic understanding and I'm going to bring you through what this 1.5 degrees, I'm going to focus on a 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, notion that is driving climate debate and climate policy globally. As you know, some of you might know, there's a big um, climate conference going on in the UAE right now, it's called COP28 and these conference of parties are basically the whole world coming together or as much of the world as possible coming together to decide to try and do something to maintain global temperatures at 1.5 degrees Celsius. So there's going to be lots of charts. Uh, bear with me. And the reason I'm using these charts and graphs is because they're in all these very, very technical documents. And I'm going to try and sort of um, walk you through some of them. And hopefully, you'll, it'll encourage you to go into the documents and sort of read the, those as well. Yeah? Okay. I'm going to get out of this. Okay, so um, for those of a certain generation, you know that it's getting hot in here. It's a song by a rapper in the 1990s by the name of Nelly. Uh, and uh, for the rest of you, you're not going to understand why I chose this title. But anyway, yes, it is getting hot in here. Um, and basically, uh, as I said just now, we're going to look at 1.5 degrees Celsius. What does it mean? How did the world come to agree on this figure? Um, so I'm going to bring you through that. This is basically a threshold, right? We hope that the climate, the temperatures globally don't exceed this, okay? Um, and why? We are seeing and hearing things like, for example, the hottest January ever, the wettest December ever, the coldest winter ever, more wildfires burning more land and forest than ever before. Floods that used to happen once in a hundred years are happening every other year. And it's all to do with temperature. Okay? So, if the, so the world got together and they decided if we can keep the temperatures below this line, 1.5 degrees Celsius, it potentially could prevent this uh, extreme climate effects from happening and effects that are irreversible. I think I saw someone say that, uh, that you know, we can't, then we can't turn back uh, the clock anymore, right? So this was agreed to in 2015, uh, and this is known as a, in what's known as a Paris Agreement. Now this is a lower threshold. In the Paris Agreement, there is a, an upper threshold, which is, which is the two degrees. So we're looking at between 1.5 degrees. If we hit 1.5 degrees, this, these are all the things that are gonna happen. If we hit two degrees, these are the other things that are gonna happen. Okay, and this is all the scientists of the world not getting paid for anything, but deciding that they would look at 
tons and tons of data to back up why they say these um, uh, temperatures have to be looked at, why we have to pay attention to these, yeah? Okay, so um, we need a baseline. Every time you want to compare something, you need a baseline. So welcome to your first graph. Um, and basically we're looking at uh, what they call the pre-industrial area, um, the period, I beg your pardon. So the Industrial Revolution was kind of like 18, I think it ended around the 1870s. However, global temperatures were not properly recorded till this period. So we, they, they always look at 1850 to 1900, and that has become the baseline, okay? Now, in this period, as you can see from this graph, uh, this is the average. Okay, so they've plotted out for the whole of the period from 1800 to 2023, and they will keep on adding to that. So this average is actually going to go up, okay? Um, so using this as a baseline, um, and looking at how temperature rises over 10-year periods, because climate is not weather. Climate, you have to look at long periods of time. Whether it's every day, every afternoon, tonight, and all that, it can change. Climate doesn't change like that, okay? So basically, using uh, this, this uh, baseline, um, every 10 years from 1880, uh, the temperature was going up by 0 0.08 degrees Celsius. And then something happened in 1981. Okay, it doubled. It started going up by 0 0.18 degrees Celsius. And then something else happened in 2011. It went up by 1.1 degrees Celsius in those 10 years. Okay, so if you can see the graph, it's basically, it's kind of like, say, going up very, very gently. And then there's a big leap in 1981, right? And it starts going up, 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 up and another one even further up this way. So if you can imagine the line that's going up, this is pretty scary, okay, for scientists. We should all be scared as well. Uh, and I, as I could see from your um, responses, some of you are scared. So uh, let's just look at this again. These are the temperature difference uh, in terms of rise of temperature. Now the 10 warmest years ever, ever since 18, um, 1850s was well, since 2010. Okay? So, we obviously need to do something about this. So, why? What is causing the warming? Again, just for those of you who are not quite sure what global warming is, what greenhouse gases are, the sun comes, it warms up the earth. If the sun didn't warm up the earth, it would be a dead planet. We wouldn't be able to survive here. Some of the radiation goes back out into space. However, to keep the planet warm, it, we need a layer of natural greenhouse gases, which then reflect this back. However, because of human activity, um, these gases have increased and increased and increased. Too little is being released back out. Most of it is being trapped, global warming. Okay? Uh, and what, what do we have? We have water vapor, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane and ozone. Now, we need to do something about it. So scientists try to do what they try to do is to predict. And they use all this massive data to try and see what we need to do to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases. And this is one of the, the, the charts that they've come up with. And basically, you can see 1.5 degrees. We have to cut down a lot to reach 1.5 degrees. People have made a lot of pleasures. This is where we are now we're going to hit 2.1 degrees Celsius, okay? Current policies, pledging is one thing. On the ground, what people are doing is another thing. We're going to hit 2.5 to 2.9 degrees Celsius. I'm looking at 20, by the end of the century, 2100, okay? Of course, if there's no policies at all, this is where we're going to be. You just follow the trajectory up, we're going to hit 4.8 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's why we need to do something, and that's why we have to do something drastic. So, um, this came from a book uh, that was compiled by Greta Thunberg. Um, this is a scientist, and basically just laying out very quickly, this is what's going to happen. If we hit 1.5 degrees Celsius, extreme heat, we're going to get four times more likely. So scientists are very careful. They're not going to say, it is going to happen, but they're saying, it's more likely it's going to happen. 
at two degrees, six times more likely, four, at four degrees, nine times more likely. Likewise with heavy rain, you can see how it goes up with drought. Now this is all based on, on as much data as they can figure out, as they can collect and that they can use. Okay, feeling depressed yet? Likewise with global um, sea level rise. So ice caps are melting, we have a lot of ice and the ocean is one big swimming pool. And we really hope that sea level rise will be very low. However, this is the one that they say low likelihood, but you know, we have data that, that says that this, is, this could happen. Uh, and that's, that's a lot, okay? So um, let's go back to greenhouse gases. So we talked about greenhouse gases just now. Now, um, the one that everybody hears about all the time is carbon dioxide. Why? Sometimes they use it interchangeably, greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide. It's because carbon dioxide makes up about 74% of all greenhouse gases. And the next uh, gas to be looking at is methane. Okay? Um, and basically, we've just been producing more and more and more and more of carbon dioxide and methane. And it's just trapping more and more of the uh, sun's rays, warming up the planet. Okay? Um, so basically, to hit 1.5 degrees, we need to cut greenhouse gases by 45%. 45%. So if you think about all the sorts of pledges that all the different countries have made, are they saying we will cut emissions by 45% uh, to hit 1.5 degrees? Right? So this is something for you to talk to your elected representatives about. Um, in fact, we are not cutting by 45 degrees. Uh, 45%, we are actually emitting more by about 9%. Okay, so let's look at the sources of greenhouse gases. I was actually a bit surprised, like there's lots of data, there's lots of different ways of looking at it. This could be very simplified, but I think if we have something maybe very simple in our heads, maybe it's easier for us to grasp or to grapple with such a big and complex issue. You talk to a scientist, they'll tell you, they'll tell me, Sulin, you're wrong. <laughs> this is not the way to do it. But roughly, 75% of greenhouse gases come from fossil fuels. If we think that we should be looking at other things, we shouldn't. 75%. Okay? And the other 25%, it's not big, but it's not small, is what they lump as agriculture and forestry. So let's get into those two in a little bit, right? So let's look at fossil fuels. What are fossil fuels? Coal, oil, and gas. A lot of countries are saying we want to transition away from fossil fuels by using gas. It's a fossil fuel, right? The sectors that use this, and these are the sectors perhaps that we should be looking at if you want to do any kind of activism, it would be, or something personally even, would be electricity generation, manufacturing, powering buildings. So cities are a big thing. And transport. Everybody in Malaysia loves their car. Everybody. Okay? Um, now, in terms of manufacturing, um, there's, there's a lot of different ways that fossil fuels are used. Uh, they're used to power manufacturing. They're used to produce products. Cement is a very, very big one. We have a lot of cement production here in this country, and there are big groups, the big companies are trying to do something about making it greener. Okay? The biggest cement uh, producer in this country, YTL, are actually part of that group. It's a very elite group, but they say they're trying to make... So you stick eco in front of everything. Eco-cement. Okay? Eco-plastic. Eco-whatever. Right? Um, powering buildings uses up 50% of electricity that's generated. 50%. Okay? So now let's look at this thing called agriculture and um, um, uh, forestry. It's a little bit complicated, but basically trees absorb carbon. They store carbon. So if you cut them down, you would have taken away that ability of trees to absorb and to store 
in addition, when you cut trees down, you actually release the carbon. Okay? Usually, why are trees cut down? Usually, large, large swathes of land or forest is cut down for agriculture to feed us. Okay? So, um, food is actually a sector that also comes out in this, these kinds of discussions. Um, in addition, things like fertilizers, manure, digestion by cows. You always hear about this methane being emitted by sheep in New Zealand or whatever, right? Uh, that's all part of this whole mix. Okay? So, I think it's been pretty depressing right now. So, we're going to take a little break and look at some animals. This is really, really a break. These pictures are taken by a good friend of mine in Sabah. His name is Sed Prudente. He's a wonderful photographer, uh, birder, and uh, documentary maker as well. So enjoy these. Anybody know what this is? Kalugo. What's a kalugo? Who owns that? Flying squirrel. So this is found in places like Langkaw like Langkawi, uh, and it, it's basically a glider. It's it's really amazing, and it it's like clings to a tree, and you, it's very hard to spot it. It's really lovely. This is who we are sharing our planet with. Okay, back to 1.5 degrees. Sorry. So it feels as if this defense that we say that we're going to put up and we're not going to cross is actually getting a little bit fragmented. It feels a bit like that, right? However, I'm going to come back to this. We can still achieve this. 1.5. We can still achieve it. Don't take my word for it. Take the scientist's word. Okay? Very complicated graph. I'll break it down for you. Basically, they've come up with, um, again, science-based, evidence-based um, suggestions as to how we can do it. So you don't know where to start. You don't know you've only got X amount of money to spend. Where do you put the money? Okay? So let's look at energy. Let's look at electricity. Okay? You can see here the two by far. So the blue means you actually don't have to spend very much money. Okay? So the, the redder it gets, it means the more expensive it becomes. As you can see, what's way ahead? Wind and solar. Way ahead. Okay? The others, yeah, not too bad. And this includes hydropower, not so effective and a little bit expensive. Okay? This also includes nuclear energy. Controversial. Okay? And of course, reducing emissions. But you see, it's expensive to reduce emissions, right? So that's energy, that's electricity. And then we look at, um, yeah, they, they love all these acronyms. It basically means agriculture, forestry, and other land use. There's another one, LU, LUSD, I call it the LULU. Um, also, land use change and stuff like that, right? Again, the scientists are suggesting this is what you could do. Okay? Let's look at the ones that are very effective. You could use carbon sequestration in agriculture. So there's technology that's involved in this sort of thing. You could also use, um, you could also like try not cutting down trees. But it's expensive. It's expensive to do these things. Okay, there are other suggestions as well. Then let's go on to buildings, our buildings, our cities. See, free, so cheap. Avoid demand for energy services. Okay? Efficient lighting. Turn off that switch. Use LED bulbs. So cheap to do and quite effective. This one is the most effective, but it's also the most expensive. New buildings with high energy performance. Green buildings, there's all sorts of in indices and indexes that can be used. Moving on to our favorite pastime, getting stuck in jams. A lot of stuff is free. Look at the blue. Very cheap to do. Look at all these different options. It's possible to do this um, with very little money. Okay? 
uh, finally factories. Very expensive. Nothing is cheap to convert factories to make them more energy efficient or to make them climate friendly. Okay? But what they're saying is switching fuels to renewables okay? is the most effective. So anyway, all this is available in the IPCC report. Let's look at Malaysia just very quickly. We know that we have to tackle fossil fuels. That is true here in Malaysia as well. So this government has done a lot of focus on what they call energy transition. And this is actually not just some by the side, okay, number seven, number eight kind of thing we do for our economy. This is actually quite core. This is being touted all over the world now as something that we Malaysians are trying to do, okay? And these are the, the different areas that they're looking at. This is controversial, carbon capture, utilization and storage. But Sarawak especially is very interested in this. Hydrogen is also a little bit controversial, not sure the technology is there, but Sarawak is doing this. Sarawak is very, very active, okay? They're using gas. So, um, energy transition is not necessarily green. So this is um, someone you might know. She's quite well known. She's really quite brilliant. Her name is Ili Nadia Zulfaka. She runs uh, KAMI, that's the Climate Action Malaysia. Lots of little NGOs. They are a feminist group because um, climate doesn't impact everyone the same way. Women get impacted more. She also works with Indigenous people, Indigenous people get impacted more. Okay? And what she's saying, you can see at the bottom here, yes, we need rapid transition. We're talking about energy transition here, but green does not mean just. Okay, so there's all these things to sort of keep in mind. And now we have this wonderful piece here. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little story. As a young journalist, many, many years ago, in 1994, I was part of a team for the Star newspaper that braved rapids, went up into the mountains, into Inner Sarawak, because they were going to build this giant dam, which had been on and then off and then on and then off for decades. And um, my boss said, you go there, you see whether they're actually going to build it or not because there's a lot and a lot of attention on it. Okay, this was going to be the biggest dam in the world, all the claims that were made, at least the biggest dam in Asia, stuff like that, right? There was a lot of talk about that. It was going to drown forests the size of Singapore, bigger than Singapore, right? Uh, and it was going to be affecting a lot of villages, indigenous people who had lived there for generations. So, we had a really tough time going in because we were pressed from Semenanjung, from Peninsula Malaysia. And people in Sabah and Sarawak do not like, uh, media in Sabah and Sarawak do not like media from Semenanjung coming over and writing about their stuff. So I think about a week before we left, I was working for the Star, New Straits Times published pages and pages of our story. Uh, what to do? We still went. And it was the most amazing experience of my life. I saw amazing forests, amazing primary rainforests. I saw huge rivers. We went through rapids um, that was so dangerous, even our guy, who was a headman from one of these interior villages, he himself was scared. Um, we stayed overnight in different villages. The first village we went to, which was the furthest that we could go to, were not receptive to us. They made us sit in front of them and tell them why we were there. And unfortunately, I got pushed to the front. <laughs> I had to go and tell them, don't worry, we're here to report as fairly as we can. Why? Because government had been telling them, don't listen to the NGO. We are doing this to help you. We're going to uplift you. This is going to be good for your economy. It's going to be good for your children. The NGOs were going to them and saying to them, you're going to drown. The dam is going to break. 
They're not going to be able to do a good job. Can you imagine such a huge dam? This is going to be terrible for you. You're going to lose all your traditional land. You're going to be forced to move far away. And then we put things media was like, no, no, we're not NGO, no, we're not government. We're just here to try and report fairly, kind of thing. So luckily, um, we managed to talk. They asked, the faces were all like that. They were sitting there in front of us. But we managed to talk them round. And it was amazing. What I saw, I still remember until today, is that it was a generation of people, of old people, older people who were living in the villages. The young people had all left. They came back once a year for Christmas. They had also left their traditional belief, a lot of them, uh, because the missionaries were very powerful. They are very powerful in Sabah and Sarawak and had converted a lot of them. So in a lot of villages, there were half. It was really literally divided. Half were still holding on to their belief systems, which had a lot to do with the land and the forest. And the other half were modernizing and were sort of leaving those beliefs behind. And they had churches in every single one of these longhouses. Uh, the other thing I noticed, I remember also, is that some of them started planting. So they have orchards as well. They don't only use the forest. They were starting to plant trees. I was going, why are you planting trees? Oh, because the government promised that they'll pay 10 ringgit one tree. So we're going to start planting now. Right? When the dam came about, so, when I, so that whole adventure over, we came back, managed to write a story, managed to find different angles somehow. And I'm so pleased to be doing this because I found my old notebook. Still, this is really, really precious. Unfortunately, I couldn't find my articles. <laughs> but what I did find was something that three of us, the three of us were there and the three of us wrote it together. And uh, it was kind of like a travel log. I don't know where my articles have gone, but it was, it was wonderful. So this is a nice kind of remembrance for me. So I'm really happy to be here doing this. Um, and I also found... It was so controversial, this dam, that the Sarawak government came up with ads. Look at this. How much they paid to produce this. New Straits Times. And more. They say Bakun is a good thing. It's a good thing to do. World-class technology for Bakun. 9,000 villagers left their traditional lands and were moved 60 kilometers away to an area called Kampung Sungai Asap. 60 kilometers away. Um, the latest, there was a report that said that Bakun Dam actually is one of the dams that's not in good repair. Uh, the Sarawak government sent their own people in and said, oh, those are small matters and the dam's fine. It's supposed to last 50 years. Kampung Sungai Asap keeps having fires breaking out um, because the construction apparently is not so good, it's all made of wood, so on and so forth, right? So when we talk about transition, when we talk about climate and having to do something, a just transition is actually really important. Green is not just, yeah? Okay, so I'm just going to end, before I open up to the Q&A, um, and I've been asked to anybody has questions or anything to say, to please use the microphone. But I'm just going to do a very quick promo for us. Um, so, Makaranga covers issues like climate change. If you go in, it's, um, we do, as I said, long form articles. But what we try to do is to go into, in more in depth, into the sort of issues that we, th we feel need covering. Yeah? Uh, so, those are just some of the climate stories that we do. We do quite a lot of deforestation stories, and we're getting into marine stories now. Uh, and we are on social media as well, so do hook up with us, uh, support us that way. We've also got um, a sort of supporters thing going, so uh, appreciate any kind of help. Journalism is very expensive, and the sort of journalism that we do is very, very expensive, and it takes time. Um, a piece could take three to six months to do. Uh, a lot of interviews, a lot of field work, and that sort of thing. Yeah? Okay, so with that little plug... I'm just going to open up to a Q&A uh, and any questions that anybody has. Hi, thank you for that. The talk was very eye-opening. Um, I'd like to ask a question about the hydroelectric dam that's actually now in, um, that's just been signed. Mm -hmm. 
um, where they want to build in Ulu Padas and also Ternum, uh, and this is Gamuda. So I'm wondering what has been the sentiment on the ground? Um, I, I haven't actually covered that, but what I do know is that there is, um, again, because local indigenous communities are involved, there's this thing called FPIC, it's Free Prior Informed Consent, and basically that's an international standard where any kind of development or land use change or whatever that you want to do, whether it's building a dam, whether it's uh, opening up the plantation, you have to at least ask these people, tell them, this is going to happen, what do you think? What are the impacts and stuff like that? So I actually haven't been following that, but I know that there is dissent against it. Yeah. 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 I think um, you know what happens is is inclusiveness. Um, so a lot of times, uh, social impact assessments are done by universities, so they will farm it out, uh, although there are consultants who do it as well, and there's always accusations of being one-sided. Or they'll say that, oh, you spoke to, you only spoke to the, the Tuai, Tuai Uma, the, the, the head of the uh, longhouse or, or the head of the community. You didn't speak to enough people, for example. That's always an accusation that goes around. Um, it's, it's a tricky one, that one, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question connected to the question that you've asked the poll, the first poll. Mm -hmm. What's, is there an information, what's the most effective uh, everyday activity that we can change in our lives, like being a vegetarian or using public transport more? Like what's, what activity is more effective out of this? Um, well, the question was actually um, voiced very, was actually worded very, very broadly. It didn't, it didn't say, what do you do, or what do we do, or what does Malaysia have to do, or what does the world have to do? There is no right or wrong answer. But I think, if you know that 75% of emissions come from fossil fuels, anything that's associated with fossil fuels has to be tackled. It has to be tackled. What you do yourself, on a personal level, is completely up to you. If you feel that, okay, I don't want to use so much plastic, that's going to help, that's what I can do, I always feel, go ahead. Do that. However, if you are, if you are a, um, an electric representative with the ability, to, or you work with policy, you are a consultant who works with policy, then you need to take into account uh, science and data like that, you know? May I know what you chose? using like reusable bags whenever I go shopping for fruits, vegetables, and like less, use less um, pockets for, for that. Um, when I'm asked if I, if I need a bag in the shop, I also I, I usually put it in mine. Um, I don't know how you? to drive a car, that's why. <laughs> that's yeah, also irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah, I think plastic is, is something that a lot of people feel that they can do. Mm, just don't use single-use plastic. Uh, just carry a, a reusable bag, bag around. Uh, plastic is made out of uh, fossil fuels. Eh? I hope everybody knows that. Okay. Uh, also, when it pollutes, and it does pollute, um, it goes into waterways, it goes into the ocean. It causes... Uh, it, 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 you know, the ocean has to be as healthy as possible to be able to fight the warming. Oceans are getting warmer very, very quickly and in huge amounts, okay? So you don't, you need the ocean to be as healthy as possible. I think at least half our oxygen comes from the ocean. We should be called sea, not earth, kind of thing. Okay? Yeah. Anything else? Hello. Uh, I'm Caroline. Uh, I'm here uh, because I'm part of an NGO called Climate Fresk, and I think we are different members here in the, in the crowd. And I, uh, yeah, <laughs> so um, I, I just wanted to, I don't want to hack your presentation, but uh, Climate Fresk is an NGO created in France by a science teacher. He wanted actually to uh, give away the learnings of the I IPCC report to the students, and he created a serious game based on some cards. Uh, so exactly what you demonstrated, 
um, the target is to give the cards to the people, to empower the people, and to enable them to understand the cause and consequences of climate change, so that even if we are not scientists, uh, you can better understand, play with the other people, understand, and this leads to, uh, yeah, wh what are you ready to do? Exactly the question that uh, the, the lady asked, what you are ready to do? in your daily life, in your company, and then one of the most powerful ways is to vote for the people who really will do things. So um, we organize free workshops every month at the Alliance Française. Uh, we have this game in different languages. It's been all around the world. We have more than one million people who followed these workshops. It's really no finger pointing, it's understanding, because education, as you said, is the first step into action. And so um, we, you, you can follow the website, Climate Fresk, or on LinkedIn, because more and more companies, and this is also who has the, the power, are the people who have money. Companies, they are the ones who can change the world. And we are all uh, employees of comp our companies, we all buy products, and I think companies yeah, are, are, are in the way of making some change. So we organize free workshops where you're all welcome, and also paying workshops for companies who want to do something for ESG. Is it greenwashing? Maybe it is. We take it, and we will do these workshops. And if it changes the mind of a few people, then slowly, slowly, we, we will all change our mind and yeah, do those little actions that are really meaning, meaningful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so long. So and check, not a check them out. And uh, I think games are very powerful. That more and more games, card games, board games are being used as a way to reach people. Because information coming to a talk like this, it's not everybody's cup of tea. So, yeah, thank you very much. And certainly good luck with that. Sorry. Thank you very much for your presentation. <clears throat> um, I also want to refer back to the poll and the different options that you gave. Um, and I'm just wondering um, whether there isn't something else that um, could be talked about here, which beyond and above all these actions, would you agree with me that the issue comes from our values, our systems? And perhaps um, if we were able to relook at our values, our consumption, our education, our what we value in life, you know, owning, buying, um, showing off what we've owned and buy, you know, all these kind of values, don't you think that this is at the core of the issue? And in relation to this, sorry to be long, but um, there's something perhaps very interesting that we should learn from indigenous people and the, around the ADAT and around the, the way that indigenous people, um, their value system, um, their belief and value system. Um, and finally, my question is, because we work in the arts, do you think that the um, arts and creativity have a role to play in supporting the fight against climate change? And if so, um, do you think that you have any initiatives in mind that you could share with us? Thank you. Especially in Malaysia, I would be very interested. Um, I'd say yes, yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, values is something, capitalism, you know, hey, let's disrupt the whole system, Greta Thunberg speaks the truth, uh, her truth, right? Um, so, and she's inspired everybody. Uh, but how do you overturn the system? Many different ways, yeah? Um, secondly, indigenous people, yes, they have their values. I think all knowledge has our own from our grandparents, uh, from, um, you know, from our communities. Uh, I think any kind of values uh, that you use to be just to be fair, to treat everybody and our planet well, I think it's something to be drawn from. Uh, the indigenous people's values change over time, just like our values change over time. I think um, something I think I'm, I'm very careful of is not to romanticize what they have and what they do. Uh, 
yes, we have a lot to learn from them, but they are, whether they want to or not, reliant still very much on natural resources. So I did a story recently on the traditional knowledge of the Marmari fishermen of Pulau Keri. Uh, people don't realize that they're actually really quite superb fishes. So these are the people with the giant masks. There's actually an artwork there depicting the Marmari as well. Uh, but they are amazing fisher folk. And they, their knowledge system has actually adapted. So before I, I told them, I asked them, so you, do you use anything traditional? And they're going, no. Um, they don't use the bubu and the, and the, and the other sort of uh, bamboo or, or sort of mangrove wood implements anymore. They use uh, plastic nets because they're just more effective, right? Um, they used to look at the moon. They, they, they still know the knowledge. They used to look at the moon so that they know where to go to catch what fish or what prawns or what shellfish. Now they, now they use the Chinese calendar because it's a lot easier, right? Um, and they are being very threatened by uh, one of Malaysia's pride and joy, which is West Port. It's a huge container port, and it's right there. And the big cargo ships come and go, dwarfing their tiny little boats. They have intruded. People forget that the ocean is also communal, that it also belongs to different communities as well. Right? And... Um, Basically, they've lost their fishing waters. So now they have to go even further out. And they're not going to look at the moon or anything because they've never, there's no traditional knowledge to draw from. They say, I just have to try. Okay, but I will go there because I have to. Gosh, if I had enough money for a GPS. All right, so, so again, these are, so I think, you know, we draw from, if you're, I know my grandmother always used to carry a bag around. She never used plastic bags. She always had this little, you know, she, she was nonya, so this woven whatever bag, and she would carry it everywhere. And for me, that was just so normal. She never used plastic bags. If we had plastic bags, she would wash them, dry them, and reuse them. So that's my sort of you know, personal kind of thing. For the arts, I might actually give it over to Rahel to see whether there's any kind of environment. I'll put you in a spot. <laughs> Yeah, I think with this exhibition, uh, particularly, um, Nirmala Dutt was an artist who was making work about environmental issues as far back as the early 1970s. I mean, we didn't even have a Ministry of Environment at that time. So incredibly, I think, forward thinking. Um, I mean, she was looking at uh, pollution, uh, the development that was happening in Damansara Heights. Um, ironically, the area that she focuses on, if you look in the GPS, I mean, in the map now, Google map, it's actually where the new pavilion has been built in Damansara Heights. So it's like, you know, nothing ever changes. Um, but, and of course, she made work about the Bakun Dam. She talked about how indigenous communities were being displaced. So I think she's a fantastic, uh, She's somebody that I feel walking through this exhibition, it really reinforces to me what an artist can do and how, um, how they can really change uh, the way people, or make people think about things differently. Um, and a lot of her practice was about that. Um, so, and I think, you know, the reason why we asked you, Silin, to come and speak was because we wanted to talk not just about the art, but the issues that she was exploring. Um, and actually, in two weeks' time, um, the Malaysian government is coming out, or it's, they are going to launch their sustainability policy, and they're actually going to do it at the gallery uh, because they wanted to do it um, surrounded by the work of Nirmala Dutt. So, you know, I like to think that she would be quite <laughs> pleased that this was happening. No, no, it, it, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, because of the number of people. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Thanks very much for that, yeah. There was one question there, uh, and then I'm, I actually want to show you the, the Bakun um, Dam area, because Google Earth, because we can, we can look at what it used to be and what it is now. So, yes. Uh, quick question. It was really interesting how you said green isn't necessarily environmental. No, and no, it isn't necessarily sorry. just. It isn't necessarily yeah. just, okay. Mm. Um, 
but how do you negotiate that kind of narrative then? Uh, because degrowth is the most obvious answer, but it doesn't feel, you can't say anything about don't do. It feels easier to give a suggestion, right? So in your journalism, how do you balance giving a suggestion versus promoting other alternatives to growth? Um, well, journalism is about, um, yes, it's, it's not objective. Journalism isn't objective. We do have a, a stance. We, are, we say it in our uh, about page, uh, the reason why we write our stories and the, 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 the direction we go into is because we want sustainable development. Okay, so we, you know we're going to push that already. However, what we try to be is fair and balanced. We try, I, I, we are not opinion writers. Uh, it's not for us to say, yes, although this is our angle, but if we speak to government and government says, uh, no, we need development. So there's a forest, bubu forest in Perak now that is going to be um, cut down. Whether or not the, there's an EIA or not, it's just going to go. And they say, no, 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 we, this one cannot stop because we have an agro-entrepreneur uh, program for youth in Perak. So we, this one has to go through. We're going to print that. But we will ask them, are there alternatives? How many youth are going to take part in this program? Um, are you going to monitor it? What are the benefits as opposed to what you're going to lose by chopping down this forest? So we can ask them that question, but we're not going to say, they want to interview you, only talk to NGO. So as a journalist, I think that's what we try to do. Our type of journalism, we really try, and that's why it's long as well, so that you can get into, okay, these, this is what you're going to lose when you cut down that forest, okay? This is who's going to be impacted. This is who's going to gain. And, and, and therefore, we try then to, to try and put nuance in. So sometimes people are not happy with our stories because they want to say, no, you should stop. You shouldn't cut the forest down. We're not going to do that. So I, I think we try. So, but we always welcome any kind of feedback from anybody. Yeah? If you feel that we've gone off, this is really not right, then write to us and we will print your thing without editing or anything. Totally. We try to be more of an engagement thing. So I, I'm just going to show you this uh, because you can look at it. This is the island of Borneo, and this is Sarawak, okay? So Putin is here, I think most of you would know where Putin is. This is the interior, Cafe. So we travel all the way here. In those days, there were no roads, it was, it was, we had to go into a baldi at one stage to cross a river. It was one of those tin things we all hanging on for dear life. I mean, it was a real adventure. Um, and uh, let's look at where Bakun is. So the Rajang River is the largest river. It's amazing. It just goes on and on and on. Um, so this is the Rajang River. They call it Batang. Eh? River is Batang. And this is uh, Batang Bandui, which is a tributary. So they flooded and they're, they're using Batang Bandui as, as the dam. It's been built. It has flooded the area the size of Singapore. And this is where it is. Uh, if you go and explore on Google Earth, or even Google Map, you, you, you'll see all this, right? So, you see the extent of it? I don't know if you can quite see it. This is all highlands, huh? This is all highlands. So the hills are now islands. And there's ecotourism, because like, ecotourism is the thing to do when you build a dam. And the villages are... All the way here. See Long Murum, the dam is here. They had 70,000 hectares, I think, of traditional lands. All here. And this is what the longhouse looks like. And from 15 communities, they all live together now. I think they have maybe separate ones, but like that's all in their own place, in one place. 
And then let's do something fun. But anyway, um, what you can do actually, they have Google Map, um, Google Earth has a, a time lapse thing where you can actually go back uh, through time. I thought I was going to be able to show it to you, but I can't find it now. So um, you can go back in time and you can see when this was all forest. And over time, from 2010, 11, 12, they started flooding it. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think I'm going to leave it at this. Uh, any more, maybe one last question, if anybody, or comment, if anybody has anything to say? Oh, two more comments, okay. Hi, um, can I, okay, all right. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for talking to us. Uh, I'm not sure if this is your area of expertise, and I think I'm going to show my ignorance here a bit. That's fine. But um, I was wondering because uh, you know, like uh, I think a huge, I think most of us know that a huge part of what drives uh, like this whole situation is the fact that we all have to use cars, right? A lot of us do, um, and uh, I mean, and I was just wondering, like a big part of what would discourage people to use cars if 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 um, infrastructure were more friendly, were more walkable. And from and um, I'm sure most people, especially people who work in offices, stuff like that, would know that, you know, Malaysia is not super walkable. It's not super accessible in that sense. So I guess what I wanted to ask was how f like, um, because I think a big part of because uh, you know because I mean because people tout electric cars as a solution, but there's a lot of doubt around that as well. And you could elaborate on that if you wanted, if you knew uh, more than I do. But I was just wondering how feasible would it actually be to improve on infrastructure that has already been made because. Um, right now, because you know, governments do come up with public transport, things like that, but it's not always the most supported area of uh, you know, like public resource. So I was just so, in your opinion, from your research, from your uh, your uh, your colleagues' work and stuff, how how much do you know about? Uh, what what we can do to either um, like uh, uh, promote the idea of making people want to fix the infrastructure or something along those lines? Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. It's 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 the, the people who are very very passionate about public transport in Malaysia. Very passionate. Um, I always feel that you know you can build it, you can knock it down. I always feel that. So, um, unfortunately, it's not for us to do. Unfortunately, it has so much to do with political will. Uh, I live in PJ, and I have uh, both an Adun and an MP who are very, very pro-public transport. And yet, PJD Link has come back again. This is a huge highway that connects. Uh, I don't know where it's supposed to connect. Anyway, it's supposed to connect two places, and all through our houses or, or whatever, right? So... Um, it's hard, it's really hard, but I, I think we shouldn't give up. We should just continue voting for the people that need, that will do, they say it's in their manifesto, and then you go after them and say, it's in your manifesto, you are my rep, I voted you in, do something about it. So that's where we come in, you know. Um, KL and Penang and JB and all the big cities were built for cars, and it's legacy, it's because Mahate wanted <laughs> a car industry, Dai Dai also won a car industry, so it's legacy, it's, it's hard, That's, it's really hard. Doesn't mean it can't be dismantled, it is all about political will at the end. And then maybe you start with your own taman, 
Okay, last mile connection. There are no buses going to my train station, to my LRT station. Go and har harangue your council person. This is why we need local elections. Go and harangue them. Provide free transport. Okay, do something, like create special bike paths. I don't know, do something. It can all be done. Uh, I, I think everything can be fixed. If you can build it, you can knock it out. I always say that. I can't remember if there was another question in there. That's fine, yeah. So you, you, you had something? Uh, so I think you mentioned about uh, how you tried to, be, to put more nuances in the, your, your writings and journalism. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it can be a risk to, you know, because longer contents is harder to read and there's less people who wants to read longer contents and make it, like, it's more difficult to read. And especially at the age where short-term contents, are, short contents are more preferred nowadays, right? So how do you balance between uh, providing and giving nuances to your articles, writings, uh, and at the same time, uh, like trying to do uh, your best in making impact with, the, with those contents? We have a very, very niche readership. We are not mass public. Um, we are not NST or the Star. Even they are not mass public, actually. I do a lot of media training, and um, uh, I always ask the journalists, who's your audience, who's your audience, who's your readership? And you'll be very surprised that even the so-called mass media have their own readership. They actually know who their re readership are. Like Mleshikini, the joke is, it's a 45-year-old or 60-year-old uncle who doesn't have anything better to do, but likes to like, you know, just mouth off a lot about politics. So that's their readership. They actually, media actually know who they are. Our readership is very specific. Um, in a way, we did this to show that Malaysians read. Everybody says, ah, oh, Malaysians don't read, Malaysians don't read, young people don't read. But actually, young people read our stuff. And I do appreciate it. And we have very passionate followers, scarily passionate sometimes. But um, our readers are very specific. They will read from beginning to end. We have policymakers. Uh, one of our, in fact, one of our first series on deforestation, it was a four-parter, uh, was used for a con by a consultant who was working on a national policy, biological policy, bio national biodiversity policy, which has just come out. And they use our stuff. That's the impact. That's how we know. People have to tell us, lah, you know, kind of thing. Otherwise, we was like, oh, don't know how. Because social media is a different animal. Social media, our, our um, click-through rates are very low. So people who read social media might not necessarily want to read our articles. So we have to take a different tag for social media. We come up with one point and then we go with it. That's how we do it, yeah? Um, so policymakers, more, polit more and more politicians coming on board, media reads us and references us. Instead of going through all the reports, we go through reports, sometimes 20 reports, and we put everything there, a little bit like an academic paper. You go to the report, you, can s you, you don't know where to go, you read an article, the report, the link is there. We put data there so that media can use it. 20 years of forestry data, we have it. And then government officers always say, no, cannot, cannot use everything top secret. Come to Makaranga and you'll be able to find the data there. We uh, are read by activists. We're read by um, students. Uh, and we have a, a lot of follow, a huge following amongst uh, communication students as well as uh, people working in the sciences, natural sciences. Yeah. So our market is very niche. Um, to add on to the answer just now about the public transport, that's the green mobility part of Malaysia, which the government is also supporting. Um, actually, now we have a company uh, called Asian Mobility who's actually doing apps where you download the app on your phone and then uh, you can actually um, go to a safe spot to pick up a, transportate, a transportation, maybe a van, maybe a car, but usually it's a van, and then uh, it will send you to your home, the last mile connection there. Um, and you talk about cars, um, yes, EV is a big thing now. It's been touted as one of the answers uh, to um, you know, um, reducing your carbon footprint. Unfortunately, a lot of EV is actually charged uh, using the main grid, electricity from the main grid. So next time you want to buy an EV, check where you're going to charge your, like, your car, because if it's electricity from the main grid, it's still fossil fuels. You know? So yeah, 
a lot of it is still there, but then the infrastructure is not there yet. So the government is actually planning to build more infrastructure, more chargers and all that, charging stations. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. I, did, I knew there was another question in there. So just to add on to that, I think that it is very controversial whether, electrical, electric, whether we should go electric because we are plugged into, into, the, into a coal-powered main grid. Most of our grid is still coal-powered. However, it's one of those things where people say, go for it. Because you wait for us to change, to, get, to wean ourselves off coal, it's going to take a long time. And it's also super expensive. Then, so we have to talk about subs subsidies and all that kind of thing. The other thing about electric cars also is emissions. Um, poor air quality is the biggest killer, uh, is the biggest health hazard in the world. Polluted air. Now, Malaysia is not India or Jakarta or anything at all, but it's still, it's, it's you know, less emission. I know you're probably going to disagree with me, but yes, and this and this, and this is the thing. Uh, I think in trying to go for uh, a lot of people um, on your side, more on your side than they're on my side. However, if you wait for the perfect solution, it's going to happen. The, the 1.5, we're not going to hit the 1.5. Yeah. We have actually hit. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's the thing that's got to be, again, a climate thing. It's got to be long-term. Then, 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 but I, I totally agree with you. Um, however, I think for me, my take is just do what is necessary. Use the recycle banks. You're not, one person, people say, I'm not going to make a difference. But have you seen a straw stuck in a turtle's nose and stuff like that? What's the alternate? What's the alternative? What's the alternative? Yeah, how, yeah, exactly. Then it'll always be, then how, do you know that a recyclable bag is, I don't know, 10 times, 20 times more difficult to recycle than a single plastic bag? Yeah, so then there's that, back to that issue again. Plastic bags are also very necessary for poor people. They need to use plastic bags because they're working, cutting your grass, MBPJ or whatever, they got no place to put their plastic bag when they go shopping. They need plastic bags. Yeah, I think you guys need to. You want to wrap this up? No, <laughs> you need your space back. Yeah, no, but it's. I mean, we can talk on and on, and absolutely appreciate it. You know, um, there's there's many many different takes on environmental. I'm very very happy to have people who are doing amazing stuff. Obviously, a lot of people are, uh, whether it's personally or in a group or whatever. Continue doing that and just lobby your representative like crazy. I'm available here for questions if you want. Um, I have some annuals from last year. Uh, we've got new ones coming up. Uh, they're 20 ringgit each. We've, I've also got some tote bags. Um, uh, again, a fundraiser for ourselves. Uh, so it's um, 100 for two. Let me see if I can get it right. Or 60 each. Uh, it's more of a fundraiser. So Christmas is coming up. If you want to support independent journalism, this is here. So thank you very much for excellent questions. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience.